I will call the remote hearing of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee to order. Today is February 24th, 2022. This meeting is held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which was passed and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House Public Information. The clerk will take attendance by roll. Chair Hansen is present. Vice Chair Wozniak. Wozniak present. Lead Heinzman. Present. Representative Acom. Present. Representative Ackland. Present. Representative Backer. Present. Present. Uh, Representative Becker Finn. Present. Representative Eklund. Present. Representative Fisher. Fisher present. Representative Representative Green. Present. Representative Igo. Representative Igo. Representative Jordan. Jordan present. Representative Keeler. Keeler present. Representative Lee. Lee present. Representative Morris or Lippert. Lippert present. Present. Representative Lewick. Lewick present. Representative Morrison. Morrison present. Representative Nelson. Nelson present. And Representative Tice. Representative Tice. It looks like Representative Igo. I go present. Perfect. Thank you. A quorum is present. Members, we have a full agenda today, but before we start, I just want to acknowledge this, this moment in time and this moment in history where uh, we are watching unfold something that uh, maybe it was our, our parents or our grandparents or even our great grandparents saw with an offensive land war in Europe. Um, it is a it is a momentous time. Uh, whatever our differences, as we are here in our democracy, um, the value of the time that we work together, whatever those differences are, uh, for the people of Minnesota. So, with that, we will start um, on our full agenda, and uh, the first up, we have. A couple of PFAS bills. We do have the minutes. Um, Representative Igo, would you like to move the minutes of February 22nd, 2022? Representative Heinzman, if Representative Igo isn't there, do you want to move them? I was about to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I would move the minutes, Mr. Chairman. Representative Heinzman moves the minutes for February 22nd, 2022. Mm -hmm. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, the ayes have it, the minutes are approved. First up is House File 3571 by Representative Batiza Watoon, DFAS prohibited in juvenile products. Uh, we have about a half an hour scheduled for this. I know there are some testifiers that will speak relating to both bills. Uh, I move that House File 3571 be recommended to be referred to the Commerce Finance and Policy Committee. Representative Katiza Watoon also has an author's amendment. Welcome to the committee, Representative. And could you please briefly explain your author's amendment? Yes, so um, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, um, the author's amendment is just to get the bill's language in the shape that we would like um, continued discussion between the um, stakeholders and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, decided that this would be um, this would allow for smoother enforcement and um, just clarification of the language. I will move the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form the author would like. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Representative Katiza Watoon, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members for having um, my, my bill be a part of the ongoing conversation about PFAS and, um, and seeing what we can do to safely remove it um, from our, our manufactured products as well as our environment um, here in Minnesota and, and beyond. Um, so 
this bill in particular addresses the use of PFAS in um, juvenile products, which um, as you can see by the bill text is, is basically um, a number of uh, products that our youngest Minnesotans come into contact with on a, on a very regular basis. And um, I, I have four young children. Um, and I think that this is, this is something that impacts uh, so many Minnesota families and households. Um, and I think that it's just really important that we have this conversation. We know that our children are utilizing these products. Most uh, families and, and parents, I think when you, when you have a child, there's so much that you don't know. And when you um, kind of start going down this rabbit hole of research of, of things that could um, you know, impact your, your child's life um, even before they um, are born. Um, and of course, PFAS is one of those things that has now been found in breast milk. So, I mean, for, for mothers, um, who are who are nursing their babies? I mean, to know that that is something that you could be um, unknowingly really um, giving your child when you think that you're doing the best thing that you can in, in feeding them um, your breast milk, then um, to kind of think that you're you're purchasing things and keeping things in your home that um, could could contribute to um, to to ongoing or um, future health challenges for them is something that can be really scary. So um, I, I know that you on this committee have so much um, background on PFAS and, and so I don't have to perhaps go on uh, much longer, but um, I will allow the, the testifiers to kind of contribute and then we can um, you know, have, have some additional discussion and questions after that. Representative Heinzman, did you have a question for the author prior to the testimony? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just if it was okay, maybe uh, the bill author could explain part of the amendment. It's not necessarily a big deal, so we could wait till after testimony, but um, if we could address that sooner than later, maybe it would be helpful. Why don't we, uh, maybe the testifiers will uh, talk about the amended, the bill as amended, and then we could, uh, why don't we go through the testimony? So thank you, Mr. Um, Chair. That might actually be. Nice. Maybe since we highlight it, they could address it. Yep. Andrea Lovell, Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Welcome to the committee and state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair Hansen, uh, and thank you, Representatives Katiza Wittoon and Jordan, for taking a proactive approach to curbing the growing spread of PFAS. My name is Andrea Lovell. I am the Legislative Coordinator at Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, a nonprofit organization with almost 50 years of experience using law and science to protect Minnesota's environment. MCEA supports these bills. They take measured yet significant steps towards addressing this public and environmental health crisis. PFAS, perfluoral alkyl substances, is an umbrella term for a class of chemicals. They are forever chemicals that do not degrade over time and are difficult and expensive to clean up. These chemicals are poisoning our drinking water, making our fish unsuitable for human consumption, and costing taxpayers millions of dollars in cleanup and associated costs. Minnesota consumers are likely unaware that the carpet they choose for their kids to play on or the clothing and furniture purchased for their children contains synthetic chemicals associated with a battery of, uh, of adverse health outcomes. As a mom of an 18 month old, it deeply concerns me that my daughter could be exposed to PFAS chemicals in the products that I buy to care for her. And I may not even be aware of it. No Minnesota parent should have to worry that their children's pajamas, crib mattress, or bedroom carpet will one day cause them to have cancer. That is a failure of regulation, not of ours as parents. These bills directly advance public health by reducing pathways of direct exposure for Minnesotans. These bills also advance environmental health. PFAS are prized for their ability to resist heat, oil, stains, grease, and water, but these qualities have serious and real consequences. The Pollution Control Agency recently announced its intention to add 15 additional waters as impaired for one particular PFAS chemical, bringing the total number of impaired waters to 26. Unless we take proactive measures on the front end before these chemicals enter the environment, more of Minnesota's prized waters, fish, and fish populations will be infected with these toxic chemicals. Importantly, these bills respond to the sirens surrounded by our, sounded by our state agencies entrusted with protecting Minnesotans uh, and the environment from toxic chemicals. We cannot clean our way out of the PFAS problem. Instead, as the PCA stated in its PFAS blueprint, the pollution must be prevented from the outside 
sets through restrictions or bans on PFAS uses. That is precisely what these bills do. In closing, I would like to remind everyone that we can thrive without PFAS in our everyday products. PFAS are manufactured chemicals that were never truly necessary. These bills aim to restore common sense by eliminating these chemicals from products Minnesotans use every day. I urge everyone to heed the calls from our state scientists, demanding legislative help in combating these insidious chemicals by moving these bills forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tony Quillis, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Tony Quillis and I'm the Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to make a couple of comments in regards to House File 3571 and House File 3180, Mr. Chairman. And I'm gonna make my comments to both and buy you some time for the other bills that you have on the agenda. Mr. Chairman and members, not to rehash my um, earlier testimony when we discussed ski wax and cosmetics and cookware, but just a reminder, there are 4,000 chemicals in this class and they all can't be treated as the same. And there's over 6,000 uses of this chemical class also. And so you just can't, when you lump them all together, you can't regulate them as a one size fits all. There's been an abundance of activity on the state and federal level and EPA Administrator Reagan has said this is one of his top priorities, and there is going to be action. And I know we worry sometimes about the federal government, but he has promised action, and in their blueprint and roadmap, has mentioned that there will be action in 2022 and first quarter of 2023. If there are alternatives, the industry has been moving to it, but all of the alternatives have not been tested. In regards to the individual bills, Mr. Chairman, there's no de minimis language in there. There's no language addressing intentionally added. And there's no manufacturer retail lag, what I call, uh, in any of the bills so far, Mr. Chairman. In regards to the individual bills in House File 3571, the Juvenile Products Bill and the other state that I've looked at that has something similar to this, there's no intentionally added language. And they have a de minimis of 100 parts per million. And if you look at the definitions of what we're talking about for juvenile products between 1.1 and 1.7, some of these products have multiple components. And under this bill, just a mere presence of PFAS, of any of those 4,000 chemicals and any of the component parts could result in a regulatory action against a manufacturer or a retailer. Third-party certification is gonna face a significant challenge as folks try to go through and get certified with over these 4,000 chemicals still sitting out as one, Mr. Chairman. In regards to the rugs and carpets, other states that have looked at this have had exemptions for such things as airplanes, trains, automobiles, uh, outdoor use has been exempted, artificial turf, and such things as wall hangings and coverings. Also, some of the other states that are looking at rugs and carpets are having public comment periods and established rulemaking where all stakeholders can have public input into how this is going to proceed. So Mr. Chairman, before I sign off, I'd like to also notice that, um, let you know that there is a letter in your packets from the Minnesota Retailers Association also addressing their concerns. So Mr. Chairman, thank you for the time. I appreciate it and I'll stick around for any questions. Thank you. Uh, Deanna White, Clean Water Action Alliance of Minnesota. Good afternoon, Chair Hansen and members of the committee. Um, good to see you again. Uh, I am Deanna White and I'm the State Director for Clean Water Action. I also serve as the Director of the Healthy Legacy Coalition, um, which as I've mentioned before, is a health-based coalition uh, focused on ensuring that consumer products, especially those for children, are made without the use of toxic chemicals. Healthy Legacy is joining with Clean Water Action on more than 50,000 members across Minnesota in support of the two bills before you today, House File 3571 and thir House File 3180. I'd like to address both in my comments, if that's all right. Um, I could go on for quite a while about the negative impacts and the increasing amount of science uh, that, that shows that we are seeing um, long-term health impacts, uh, particularly among juveniles. But I put that into my written testimony with I think has been spread around to all of the committee at this point, and you've heard it from me before. So I'm gonna save a little time and just say that um, PFOS 
is not something that, uh, that we need to have in our environment or in our bodies. And eliminating the uses of PFAS uh, is a key opportunity to prevent pollution as well, which I know is a particular purview of this committee. So the bill, bills before this committee prohibit PFAS in two different product categories, juvenile products and home and commercial furnishings. Children should not be exposed to hazardous chemicals where they eat, sleep, and play. Yet product testing has found PFAS in a variety of products for infants and kids under 12 years of age. The products in which PFAS was detected included baby bibs, car seats, and mattresses. And that just scratches the surface. Children are more vulnerable to health impacts from chemicals because low levels of exposure can disrupt key stages of development. PFAS in particular is especially harmful to children. A review of 64 health studies found positive associations between childhood exposure to PFAS and asthma, high cholesterol, and reduced kidney function. And I have referenced the uh, footnotes for all of the studies that I mentioned in my written comments. Adults and children also are also exposed to PFAS in home and commercial furnishings. This exposure can come from furniture, carpeting, and a variety of other textile furnishings. A 2018 study found PFAS in half of the carpet samples tested. Since that time, Shaw Industries, the largest carpet manufacturer in the world, and Interface, the largest commercial carpet manufacturer in the world, both stopped using PFAS. Major retailers Lowe's and Home Depot have stopped selling residential carpets containing PFAS. And while this market move, movement is certainly welcome, we need strong policies to stop the widespread use of PFAS chemicals, whose entire life cycle is hazardous to people and the environment. When PFAS containing products are used and disposed of, PFAS can migrate out of these products and in, into the environment, including groundwater and sewage sludge. As a result of the widespread use of PFAS, more and more communities are being forced to address PFAS contamination in their drinking water sources. The difficulty and expense in treating PFAS contamination is a burden on communities and on water systems. We know that a growing number of Americans are drinking water containing PFAS. In an attempt to recover some of the massive costs of PFAS cleanup, 13 states have already sued or begun proceedings to sue the manufacturers of PFAS chemicals for contaminating water supplies and other natural resources. The public has been warned about the dangers of PFAS for years. In 2015, over 200 scientific experts raised the alarm on PFAS. The experts' concerns were so significant that they recommended that PFAS should only be used for essential purposes given their known health and environmental hazards. Responsible companies have heeded this warning by ending their use of PFAS, <clears throat> but that's not enough. States are now leading the way on PFAS pollution prevention. Over 30 states across the country are taking action on permanently closing the door on uses of PFAS and products. We're asking the state of Minnesota to heed the call of EPA Administrator Michael Regan when he stated, every level of government from local to state to tribal to federal will need to exercise increased and sustained leadership to truly make progress on PFAS. And just to mention a couple of other items um, in regards to the amendment from the author that I believe we're gonna be talking about in question and answer. It's my understanding that this language is to make this bill consistent with other product bans that we've done over the years um, that would be very clear that it's about marketing, selling, distributing and manufacturing to make sure that we're covering all of our avenues and being consistent in our policies. And we support that amendment and that change. Minnesota has been a national leader in prohibiting other harmful chemicals, and we hope that you'll continue this leadership by supporting these two bills, HF 3571 and HF 3180 today. Thank you for your time and for your patience. Thank you. Lori Ollinger, Sierra Club. Welcome to the committee and state your name for the record. Hi, uh, thank you, Chair Hansen and committee members. My name is Lori Olinger and I'm with the Sierra Club North Star Chapter. We have 80,000 members in Minnesota and I'm testifying today in support of these two bills. PFAS falls into a special category of chemicals known as PBTs, persistent bioaccumulative toxic. And PFAS are highly persistent. The carbon fluorine bond is one of the toughest, strongest, and they do not degrade in the environment. They bioaccumulate and can remain in our bodies for years. And once exposure levels are high enough to cause harm in humans, animals, or wildlife, their impacts are not easily reversed. Very low concentrations of PFAS in lake water can result in high concentrations in the tissue of fish. PFAS production emits a potent greenhouse gas, HCFC22, which is 5,000 times more potent than carbon dioxide. It was banned under the Montreal Protocol, but a loophole 
allowed companies to release it if it was used in the production of another chemical, in this case, PFAS. And PFAS is an endocrine disrupting chemical that can interfere with our hormones. And pregnant women are particularly vulnerable since their exposure can impact three generations at once, the mother, the baby, and future grandchildren. Fertility is one of the areas of concern. Another is obesity. One review study in 2017 found, quote, there is a compelling body of evidence suggesting that prenatal PFAS exposure could affect fetal growth and subsequent risk of childhood obesity. Several studies have found PFAS in children's sleeping products such as crib mattresses and car seats, and infants are exposed to these products for long periods of time. Carpets and rugs are also one of the high exposure routes for children since they spend so much time on the floor. PFAS flakes off and gets on their hands, and they're also breathing PFAS-laden dust from carpet and furniture. Another recent study found measurable amounts of PFAS in the air in homes, workplaces, and schools. Some retailers, including Lowe's and Home Depot, have stopped selling PFAS-treated carpet and rugs, and Lowe's has switched to fabric protectors that are PFAS-free. And just last week, the U.S. textile manufacturer Millikan has found to eliminate PFAS from its fibers and finishes portfolio by the end of the year. This shows that manufacturers can switch to PFAS-free products successfully. PFAS pose a risk to everyone, but especially to babies and children, since the risk is highest during times of development. That's why these two bills are so important to lower our exposure, especially for our children. PFAS are frequently found in commercial and home furnishings and impossible for consumers to avoid because they're not disclosed on labels. PFAS and juvenile products pose a serious threat for our children. Alternatives to PFAS for stain and water resistance are available. And I ask that you support these two bills to protect our health and our environment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try to get back to uh, the question I had earlier. It doesn't seem that any of the testifiers address the amendment. So if, if uh, Representative Katiza Watoon could look at the amendment line 1.3, it specifically deletes everything after not and inserts manufacture, sell, offer for sale or distribute in commerce in the state. I'm just curious what prompted the amendment and what the reasoning was specifically. And then if I could address that as well as a number of other concerns, that'd be great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Katiza Matun. Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Heinzman, for the question. Um, as I mentioned briefly um, before we um, for the committee voted to amend the bill. Um, it just is to add a little bit of additional clarity. So it's only deleting um, the remaining um, portion of that line after not. So sell or distribute in commerce in the state. So then those are included in the amendment text, um, but then just adds in manufacture or offer for sale. So um, I'm not exactly sure if you have concerns about that language or um, if, if you, I, I'm, I don't. I don't really understand what the what the question is. I mean, Mr. It just Chair, is, I can for additional clarity. clarity. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, if I'm reading the language correct, previously, your language only included those that distribute in commerce, and now you're going to go after anybody that manufactures. So, you know, Representative Katiza Watu, and I'm not sure. If you're familiar with something, and this is just an example. We have something in the lakes area that's super popular every summer. There's literally hundreds of people that participate in these pop-up markets. And I'm sure that's happening all over the country, all over Minnesota. And it's usually people that just rent a very small space for the day, a lot of moms and dads and just regular folks. And they're making, for example, could be kids products, and they're doing the best they can, but your new language here will now go after anybody I'm assuming. I don't see any limits on the size of the business or so on and so forth. It's just saying now they're linked in and I'm going back to the enforcement that's still in the language under line 2.10 under sections 115.06, excuse me, 0 0.071 that says they could be subject up to a $10,000 fine and potentially more. 
I don't understand this strategy. I, you're now going to go after people potentially in Minnesota, just trying to earn some extra money on the side. And if they mess up and they manufacture a product under this language in a pop-up market, I think if this became law, they could be looking at serious fines and more. And you described the amendment as somewhat technical, whereas you're looping in an entirely new group of people into the language that, that we were previously looking in. Now we have another group that we're going to go after. You know, I, that's super frustrating. And I hope maybe represent Katiza too, and you could address that and what, what your reasoning is, because that's not just technical. Maybe I misunderstood your answer. It seemed that you misunderstood my question. So hopefully that straightens it out for you and that can be addressed. And I also have some more questions if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Representative uh, Katiza Watoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for the additional clarification, Representative Heinzman. Um, I think that, um, you know, if we need any additional um, clerical and clarifying information, we can maybe look to house research, but I mean, it's, it's similar to previous bans. Um, we are, we're just looking to strengthen um, the existing language. And I think that solely solely because um, the MPC, MPCA would have the regulatory authority to go after um, people who manufacture these, um, these sorts of um, products, that doesn't mean that they will. Um, and if it's on a very small scale, and if these are moms and dads that you're talking about, if they knew that they were manufacturing something with PFAS, I'm pretty sure that they would choose not to do that. Um, so I think that, you know, if if in um, partnership with you, in order to make the bill better, um, if there is additional language that we can improve um, how this, you know, if there are limits or there are um, other um, concerns that you have, I'm, I'm definitely open to those conversations. We do have another stop in commerce um, next week. Um, and we had a really enlightening conversation on PFAS yesterday. Representative Waslick had brought a number of her bills to commerce yesterday. So um, yeah, and it looks like um, Mr. Johnson from the MPCA is, is raising his hand, Mr. Chair, if um, you can allow him to comment. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, if you could uh, maybe help uh, address Representative Heinzman's question, uh, introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members and, and Representative Heinzman uh, in particular. Um, for the record, my name is Tom Johnson, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I just wanted to point out um, that the enforcement of these types of, uh, of product bans uh, has been in conjunction with uh, MPCA, the Department of Commerce, uh, the Department of Health, as part of something called the uh, Chemicals and Products Interagency Team. Uh, that was uh, put together in, in 2016. Since that time, there have been 15 uh, separate in instances where companies have not been compliant with uh, Minnesota law as it relates to banned chemicals and products. And all of those 15 instances have not resulted in a, uh, an issuance of a civil penalty, such as the the $10,000 that uh, Representative Heinzman is referring to. So uh, we have not used um, that, uh, we have not had to issue any sort of penalty in, in, in any of those 15 cases that have that have come up in that time. Senator Thank Heinzman. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It, <laughs> if, uh, if we don't need the potential for a $10,000 fine, Representative Katiza Watoon, I don't know why you're including that in your bill. And we just heard in testimony from MPCA, which I'm assuming you met with to go through this and understand the impacts, maybe you could let us know, uh, that if they're not using that kind of language, then maybe it's unnecessary in your bill and you can find other ways to enforce the law rather than potentially threaten someone who may or may not know. And I'm one of those guys that was running a small business many, many years ago, just starting. And I'm using coatings in my products. And some of the things I made were, for example, rocking horses for kids. And I'm going over to the local store and I'm purchasing products. I'm just starting. And it seems to me that it's very easy that some of those coatings could have contained this product and 
someone could selectively come to me and maybe have a problem with me and my business and look for a reason to try to hurt my new business. I'm not saying that happened, that that is going to happen, but if you're including that in the bill, that is a concern. I don't understand why we couldn't find a better way to help people understand the dangers of this rather than potentially uh, looking for fines, which could happen, even though we just heard from MPCA that it hasn't in the 15 cases that we're aware of. You know, so that's something that is frustrating. We're going after potentially some small business people that are doing the best they can. And it's, it's a strange, I, I'm gonna move on to another question though. So, uh, Representative uh, Heinzman, I wanna get Representative, okay. I wanna get Representative Becker Finn in so we make sure we've got everybody who's got their hand up and then I'll come back to you. So I've given you three, uh, we'll go to Becker Finn and then we'll come back, if that's okay. So Mr. Becker Chair, Finn. do you think that Representative Katiza Kuntun would actually be able to ask, answer the question, did she meet with MPCA on this? Um, Representative Heinzman, I think she actually did reference that when she said the PCA is here, who she was working with. So, Mr. Chair, I, I will, specifically I was asking if she had met with MPCA on this, Mr. Chairman. Representative Heinzman, you know you're out of order. That was Mr. Chair. I was, was just asking a question. You were you were um, not just asking a question. Mr. Chair, I am literally just asking a question. Did Representative Katizwa to meet with MPCA? Representative Katiza Watun. I believe you're on mute. I think I was unmuted and then I muted myself. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Heinzman. Um, I uh, this bill has been a part of a PFAS package um, previously, and so MPCA has been consulted. I introduced this bill um, just last week, it, and I'm, I'm so pleased that we're able to come right to environment to have a hearing on it. But um, no, in, in between last week when introduced and this, this hearing, I have not met with MPCA specifically. So I'm, I'm open to further communications on them. I would like to um, point out that I think that you're making much ado about nothing. When there's 15 cases of this, why would we pass a law that says that MPCA doesn't have the potential to enforce a law even though it hasn't been able, they've, they've taken the, the, the steps that have needed to be taken up to the point where they would need to potentially find a small business or a large business. And so including manufacturers in this amendment and in the bill makes it possible for them to do it should it be necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the answer to my question. So the bill author did not meet with MPCA on this. Thank you. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, first, I'll remind everybody that this is not a cross-examination. This is a hearing on a bill to keep kids from being exposed to poisonous chemicals. And so um, I know we're upset about the rocking horses, but I think we need to take a step back. And, you know, the, the point of this bill is to protect kids from poisonous chemicals. And I thank you, Representative Katiza Watoon. And whether you met with MPCA in the last seven days or we've been talking with the MPCA for literally years about this, um, the MPCA has been an active part of these discussions. Um, and I just really appreciate that you're bringing this bill forward. Um, I did want to point out for the record, um, it was somewhat helpful to, to, to hear about uh, Representative Heinzman's own business because I was really lost there for a minute trying to figure out what you were talking about because I do want to make sure for people who are, are listening that um, the prohibition is on new juvenile products so this isn't going to uh, impact um, flea markets, garage sales, those kinds of things. That's, that's not what we're getting at here and I think um, extending it to those who manufacture it makes sense. Um, we want, we don't want anyone to be exposed to these chemicals. And I think about the workers uh, at the water gremlin plant. And the problem was that it was also in the manufacturing. And so people were being harmed at that point in the process too. And so I don't want, um, if there are other mom and pop rocking chair manufacturers, I don't want them exposed to those chemicals either. And so I think that that's um, an important part. And I'm glad that we added that in there. Um, I also want uh, to say, there was mention of, don't worry, the feds are going to take care of it. 
Um, I had one of the first PFAS bills uh, several years ago um, on firefighting foam, and we heard the exact same testimony then. Don't worry, the feds are going to regulate this. We don't need to do anything. And that was back in uh, 29, January 2019. Um, and it's now almost March 2022, and they've yet to, to regulate those things further. So um, this is absolutely what we need to do the same way we were the first ones to do something about TCE. Um, glad that we are leading on this, especially when it comes to protecting children. Um, just really want to thank you, Representative Katiza Batun, for all your work on this. Representative Katiza Batun. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Beckerfin, for your comments. Um, I, I completely agree. And um, Mr. Chair, I think um, if, if anybody else has any further questions, um, otherwise I'm ready for, it looks like Representative Oswald has her hand up. Otherwise, um, just let me know. I'm ready to close when you are. <laughs> we'll go to uh, Representative Wozniak, and then we'll go back to Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to thank Representative Katiza Batu and sort of echoing what Representative Beckerfin said, um, that these are toxic chemicals and they don't need to be in kids' products. There are alternatives we can be using and we should be using those alternatives. Um, I also want to just note that um, there's conversations about the feds and science and all these things. And, and the companies that made these products knew, these, knew that these chemicals were bad back in like the 50s or 60s. And we didn't actually get a settlement with 3M until what, the last, sometime in the last decade or so, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so I, I think the point about how quickly the feds can move um, just isn't really relevant to this discussion. We don't have to sit or we shouldn't sit around and wait for the feds to act um, on this issue, especially when our taxpayers are footing the bill, our, our state of Minnesota taxpayers are footing the bill um, for cleaning up these, these messes caused by these chemicals. So just want to, again, thank Representative Katiza Wittun for bringing this bill forward. Um, it's part of the, the MPCA's efforts that they've They've put out there in their blueprint to uh, work on the prevention piece to stop these uh, chemicals from continuing to get into the environment and continuing to be exposed to them in our homes. Um, and I appreciate that effort, particularly when it comes to our little ones, because they are um, in those early stages of development. It's really important that they have um, healthy environments to grow up in. Thank you. Representative Katiza Batun and Helper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I promise I did not time the ending of my son's nap <laughs> to coincide with this testimony but um thank you representative Wozlik, for your leading um, work on, on PFAS and um, appreciate your comment. Representative Heitzman. Thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to address a couple of things. I did have one or two final questions. Number one, we all agree that these are dangerous chemicals and we want to all work together towards solving this problem. And so I don't want there to be any confusion. The difficulty is when we start singling out people in the crosshairs of our effort to solve a problem who don't necessarily, uh, they're not necessarily in a position to even know that they're breaking the law. There are bad actors out there who know exactly what they're doing and they're using products that they don't need to. And we're also having a huge downstream problem. We all agree they're not called forever chemicals for no reason. And we have a big job trying to make sure that those chemicals that are on the land currently and in our uh, wastewater treatment facilities and so on and so forth, that that's covered and that we're addressing it. You know, so I applaud the effort. The problem is going after these folks. And so I have two questions I want to quickly get covered. Number one, uh, I'm reading the language and it does appear that California has a similar law. Uh, and I'm curious if this bill follows California law in the, in the exact same way or if there are differences. And if not, or if there are differences, why? So if that could be addressed, that'd be helpful because this is very, very similar to what California has done. And then also uh, someone mentioned that uh, this bill does not affect flea market sellers who produce products uh, on a small scale. So I, if that's in the language, I missed that. And maybe the bill author could address that issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Heinzman, was that it for questions? Uh, there may be more, Mr. Chairman, but at the moment, yes, that is that is it. Representative Katiza Watoon. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in, in terms of the language in, in comparison to the um, uh, bill that they have in the state of California, I may ask House Research to um, shed some light on that, please. <laughs> Ms. Taylor. Um, Mr. Chair and members, I have not looked carefully at the California language and I wasn't involved in the drafting of this, so I wouldn't need to go and do a comparison in order to answer the question, but I can get back to the committee on how closely they are. And uh, Representative Katiza Watoon on the flea yeah. market question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, Representative Hankson, I, I think, yeah, that um, flea markets and used products were brought, brought up um, in, in a comment. And so it, it does not apply to used. Um, sorry. sorry about that, we're very sad today. Um, so in page two, page two, line eight B, this subdivision does not apply to sale or resale of used juvenile products. So somebody is selling existing products that has been on the market or um, selling them at a, at a Mr. Chairman, or situation. Mr. Chair, then, um, um, Representative Hines been let uh, Representative Katiz and Watoon is I, still I wasn't speaking. Able to, I wasn't able to hear Mr. Chair. I apologize. I, I'm not trying to be difficult. I, I just okay. Um, thank you. Representative Katiz Sorry Watoon. about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am speaking in, in regards to page two, line eight. The yeah. subdivision does not apply to the sale or resale of used juvenile products. Um, so if somebody is selling a product that already exists on the market, um, they're selling it at a flea market or a garage sale or a Facebook marketplace, um, then, it, then this bill does not apply. So hopefully that answers your question. Representative Heinzman, I've got two more hands up again. So, all right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I appreciate your discretion. So, uh, I was specifically referring earlier to pop up markets, and I was a manufacturer of a small item that might appear in one of those that was a new product. So, I wondered what maybe uh, those that were addressing that in a flea market context were looking at because I saw something different in the bill language. Mr. Chair, is it possible that Mr. Quillis could address? The issue that I had in the questions about California. Um, why don't we get uh, Representative Wozlick's question and Representative Becker Finn's question, and then we'll have whoever. Those are the last three questions. We've gone over about 15 minutes on this, so why don't we have them ask their question, and then anybody can answer any of the questions. I will give time to. So, uh, so we've got the Heinzman question, uh, Representative Wozlick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, not really a question, more a comment. It seems like we keep hearing that everyone takes this seriously, but I don't see PFAS related bills coming from Republicans. Um, in fact, they won't even sign on to my bills um, in the House or the Senate. So we can say that we're all taking this seriously, um, but I have not had engagement from anybody um, beyond you know, the folks that I've already talked to on this issue of if we all take this seriously, then why why are we not getting the support? I understand that we don't want to target specific manufacturers or products, but then what is the solution? I am fine with people criticizing how we how we deal with a problem, but then you got to come up with some solutions. And if all you're going to do is complain, that's not an answer. And I'm just sort of fed up with it and with the uh, disrespectful tone that Representative Heinzman has been taking with on this committee the past several weeks. And I, I just Hope that we can we can be civil and, and work together and really address this issue um, going forward. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn. I thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I guess I would just encourage. It's clear that the author of this bill um, was not trying to copy California. Um, she was trying to protect kids from uh, being exposed to chemicals. As to the flea market comment, since I was the person who made that comment, um, it was in relation to. Uh, lines 2.6 and 2.7 that this would apply to new juvenile products. Um, uh, very familiar with uh, flea markets and garage sales in rural Minnesota, and I don't think there are that many people making brand new um, products that would fall under uh, these, these categories. And I think we don't want those people using those chemicals either um, while they're making the products. So thank you, Mr. Chair. So to the testifiers, does anybody want to address those three questions, comments, the testifiers. Mr. Chairman, 
just looking at a quick perusal of the California bill dealing with juvenile products, they are very similar to each other um, with the exception of, as I had mentioned, it looks like the definition of intentionally added and then the presence of a product that has PFAS at or above 100 parts per million. Any of the other testifiers to the questions or comments? Okay, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's, there's been a few comments made specifically in reference to my questions. And there, it, it seems like this is the place to ask questions. So for it to be taken the way it is apparently or has been taken, is super confusing. I would like to thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to ask questions today. And I, I, um, I'm trying to understand why the hostility, and quite often, or quite honestly, not that long ago, there was a discussion about questioning motive. And we could probably have that conversation again today, because my motive is to make sure that we all understand it's this. not bill. your questions, it's your interruptions. Oh, wait, questions. wait a second. Hold on. Yep. Everybody. That's what it is. Everybody. Okay. Everybody. Hang on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, have, uh, just I, wait a second. Let's just hold a second. Take a breath. Representative Heinzman. And, and I will let you speak. We are trying to get through this bill. We have other bills that are going. I have given you great latitude today. Um, and I understand where your, where your questions are. We also have other people on the committee and we have the testifiers that are here to answer questions. I wanna be cognizant of their time and make sure that we are directing questions to them or to the author and rather than going back and forth with each other. We have limited time here. We all know that we all are tired of doing this um, way we have to do it, but let's please, let's go back and look at the context of the day we are in and try to be um, civil to each other. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and just to clarify, uh, this is obviously the place to ask questions. And I have not interrupted anybody. I'm simply trying to make sure that the folks that I'm concerned about and bringing attention to and, and say today's example, pop-up markets who manufacture items who may inadvertently make a mistake. I don't want them hurt. People like that. And so I'm bringing that up. And uh, once again, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to do that and for the, as you mentioned, latitude. Okay, we're gonna vote. So Representative Katiza Watoon, any closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity for this bill to be heard. I appreciate the robust conversation and line of questioning from Representative Heinzman. I would um, like to remind him, he may have forgotten on our time in early childhood together that, that I actually am a landowner in Ottertail County. I've visited a number of those pop-up markets frequently um, with my family that lives in Ottertail County, and I'm a big supporter of small business. So um, I don't think the MP MPCA's intention is to go after individual proprietors um, at, at these sorts of things. I'm willing to have further conversation with you if you have improvements on the language. And uh, members, I appreciate the support for getting PFAS out of these products to keep our kids safe, keep our environment healthy in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. I'll renew my motion that House File 3571, as amended, be recommended to be re-referred to the Commerce, Finance, and Policy Committee. The clerk will take the roll. All right, Chair Hansen. Aye. Hansen votes aye. Vice Chair Wozniak. Wozniak, aye. Aye. Lead Heinzman, Josh? No. Heinzman votes nay. Representative Acomb. Aye. Acom votes aye. Representative Ackland. Ackland votes aye. Aye. Representative Backer. Backer votes not, um, um, no. Backer votes no. Backer votes nay. Uh, Representative Becker Finn. Becker Finn, aye. Becker Finn votes aye. Representative Eklund. Aye. Eklund votes aye. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. 
Fisher votes aye. Representative Green. No. Green votes no. Representative Igo. Igo no. Igo votes no. Representative Jordan. Jordan aye. Jordan votes aye. Representative Keeler. Keeler aye. Keeler votes aye. Representative Lee. Lee aye. Lee votes aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert aye. Lippert votes aye. Representative Lewick. Lewick votes no. Lewick votes no. Representative Morrison. Morrison aye. Morrison votes aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson votes no. Nelson votes no. Representative Tice. Tice no. Tice votes no. The chair, there are 12 ayes and seven nays. The motion prevails on a bipartisan vote. Next up. Congratulations, uh, Representative Katiza Watu, and you're on to Commerce. House File 3180, Representative Jordan PFAS prohibited in home commercial furnishings. Representative Jordan, will you move that House File 3180 be recommended to be re referred to the Commerce, Finance, and Policy Committee? So moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Jordan, you also have an author's amendment. Would you move the amendment and explain it briefly? Uh, so moved, Mr. Chair. Uh, my amendment is one word on page two, line four. Um, we insert not. After the word not, we insert manufacture. Representative Jordan moves the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form the author would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Representative Jordan, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, we've heard extensive testimony on PFAS and its, and its effects in this committee. You know that PFAS adversely affects human health and can cause cancer, high cholesterol, liver damage, fertility issues, and much more. You know that PFAS does not break down in our environment and will remain present in our soil and water for so long that they are known as forever chemicals. You also know that we in the legislature have the power to protect Minnesota from exposure to PFAS. This bill takes an upstream approach to PFAS mitigation by prohibiting the sale of industrial textiles with PFAS. When we talk about these sorts of textiles, we're talking about rugs and carpeting, upholstery furniture, and cleaning products applied to those textiles. It's crucial for us to consider the PFAS in these products while they're in our homes and when they're in a landfill. As you all know from my presentation on carpet recycling last year, these products are very difficult to recycle and the majority of these products end up in our landfills where they leach PFAS into water and soil. Um, I'm not sure if there are any testifiers left, but I will turn it over to anyone who has some. But members first, I want you to think about your furniture and carpeting at home. When I think about this, I think about my cat walking around, taking a nap, or playing with a ribbon on my carpeting. I'm thinking about my brand new nephew, Luca, learning how to crawl. I'm thinking about playing checkers with my nieces in the basement. I'm thinking about taking a nap on my couch after watching the bears and everyone lose on Thanksgiving. These thoughts and memories shouldn't be poisoned with PFAS any more than our bodies, water, and soil should. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to go to remaining testimony, if there is any. The testifiers who signed up are the same. Um, are there any who would like to uh, address this bill again? Ms. Lovo, Mr. Quillis, you already spoke. Ms. White, Ms. Olinger. Otherwise, any questions, Mr. Chair? Any questions for the author? Representative Jordan, I want to go back to Mr. Quillis. I have a couple questions for you. Mr. Quillis. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Quillis, if I understand your testimony, you, you want a de minimis level? You would like to define uh, the actual PFAS that you want prohibited and uh, you want intentionally added. Is that what you're looking for? Or is that what your concerns are? Mr. Chairman, those are my concerns. And when I look at um, some of the other bills that have been posed in other states, they include intentionally added. And we had this debate last year during the food packaging. Some of them include de minimis, as I pointed out before, in the juvenile products. They, in the juvenile products bill in California, they included 100 parts per million. And other states have exemptions 
for certain products. Like I said, in the, in the carpet and rug, uh, and I can't remember which state I looked at, I think it was California that's proposing right now before there, it might've been the state of Washington, Mr. Chairman. Let's just say this for clarification. Another state is looking at a number of exemptions that have happened under the carpet and rug proposals that are out there, including outdoor carpeting, carpeting, like I said, for automobiles, trains, and airplanes were some of the ones I looked at. And Mr. Quillis, um, can the Chamber of Commerce or the manufacturer identify out of all these chemicals that the worst top 10 or, or even the top three worst, ones that are the most toxic, the most lethal to people, do we have that information? Or does the manufacturer know? Mr. Chairman, I don't have that information right in front of me. I'm assuming that others who are closer to this probably have that information, but I don't have it right in front of me right now. No. Representative Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it will, appears Representative Ackland and Representative Wazilek um, have questions or comments. Representative Ackland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, see if somebody can uh, clarify for me just a little bit. It seems that from what I've heard that most of this chemical is added as a stain resistant uh, property. And I'm wondering if it's actually purposefully added as a flame retardant to uh, particularly children's clothing or carpeting or sofas. Uh, we've heard in the past, you know, children's clothing needed to be flame retardant. Is this chemical being used for that purpose or not? Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for that uh, question, uh, Representative Ackland. I don't know the exact purpose of it. Um, perhaps Ms. White does, but I do know that there are other products available that work as stain, um, as stain remover or stain propellers that do not have PFAS in it. So there are um, products out there on the market that do not have these chemicals and are not treated with it. But I'm not sure what the primary purpose of the PFAS in these chemicals is. Um, maybe Ms. White does. Ms. White. Um, I can definitely check and get back to you. I do not believe that they are typically used for flame retardant purposes, although I will absolutely check. They uh, PFAS is used for example, in firefighting foam on oil and chemical fires, it is largely a repellent. Um, and that is the, the primary um, purpose that they often put towards it. But I can double check for sure. But I, I don't believe if anyone else knows differently, I'm, I will happily defer. Representative Ackland. Thank you. So that, that is my concern is if it's used for flame retardant. Uh, purposes back to Mr. Coelis, you know, is there is there some, um, I, uh, you know, minimum amount that uh, balances out the flame resistance uh, with the other possible problems, and maybe there's another flame retardant that's out there that doesn't contain PFAS. I don't know. So that was my question. Thank you, Representative Wazwick. Mr. Chair. Oh, Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and going to our good friend Google very quickly, I, I Googled, <laughs> is PFAS a flame retardant? And um, it the, the top couple hits do um, talk about the foam that uh, Representative Becker Finn worked so hard to remove it from, but it seems that in um, textiles and materials and cloth, it, a different sort of chemical is used as a flame retardant other than PFAS. But I think we can do some more digging and I think that would be a good thing to look into. So thank you for the question. Representative Ackland, that okay? Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Yep. Representative Wozlowick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just brief in reply to your question about toxic chemicals, the Toxic Free Kids Act required the Department of Health to actually have um, lists of high high concern uh, chemicals. And so if I don't think Mr. Quillis is able to look at that list and come up with a response, but that list does exist. And um, there, there are certainly information out there for retailers to know what those um, chemicals are and try to not use them in their products. Just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Wazowick. Any other questions from members? Representative Jordan, would you like to close? 
Uh, PFAS is bad, Mr. Chair. If it's a good bill, please vote yes. Representative Jordan renews her motion that House File 3180, as amended, be recommended to be re referred to the Commerce, Finance, and Policy Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Hansen. Aye. Hansen votes aye. Vice Chair Wazowick. Wazowick, aye. Aye. The lead Heinzman. No. Heinzman votes no. Representative Acom. Aye. Aye. Representative Acon. Yes. Aye. Representative Backer. Representative Backer. Representative Becker Finn. Becker Finn, aye. Representative Eklund. Aye. Aye. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher votes aye. Representative Green. No. Green votes no. Representative Igo. Igo, no. Igo votes no. Representative Jordan. Jordan, no. Jordan votes no. Jordan, yes. I'm sorry. Jordan it's my votes bill. aye. <laughs> Representative Keeler. Keeler, aye. Keeler votes aye. Representative Lee. Lee, aye. Lee votes aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert, aye. Lippert votes aye. Representative Lewick. Lewick, no. Lewick votes no. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison votes aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson, no. Nelson votes no. Representative Tice. Tice, no. Tice votes no. I'm just going back, Representative Backer. All right. Uh, Chair, there are 12 ayes, six nays, and one abstain. You're muted. muted the, motion prevail, the motion prevails. Representative Jordan, your strong bipartisan bill is on its way to Congress. Uh, next up, uh, Vice Chair Wozniak, if you would take the, the gavel. All right, next on the agenda is House File 3617. Representative Hansen, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Madam Chair, I will move that House File 3617 be recommended to be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. All right, Representative Hansen, why don't you tell us about your bill? Uh, members, uh, it's a very short bill, this provides 450,000 to the DNR for grants to lake associations to manage aquatic invasive plant species. I have Jeff Forrester from the Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates to testify to the bill. Mr. Forrester, if you wanna unmute yourself and introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Jeff Forrester. I'm executive director of Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates. Um, Starting back in the early 2000s, the DNR used to have about $850,000 a year that they would offer in grants to lake associations trying to manage aquatic invasive species. And while it's not widely understood, uh, really the burden for managing these species in lakes falls on local communities. Uh, and lake associations. Uh, in some cases, there's lake improvement districts that can uh, you know, use a tax line on local tax bills to raise money for this kind of work, or lake associations do it uh, philanthropically. They just raise the money. Um, a Concordia College Moorhead study found in 2017 that lake associations contribute uh, over $6.25 million um, and 1.2 million hours uh, in lake conservation activities, including AIS inspection, AIS treatments, uh, water quality testing, community education, outreach, uh, fish stocking. Uh, in 2015, the Minnesota DNR zeroed out the AIS management grants, but when the AIS surcharge was increased a few years ago. They brought that back up to 450,000. Um, since those grants uh, were established back in the early 2000s, the number of lakes that have AIS has grown substantially. Uh, so the need is getting bigger and uh, we strongly support this uh, grant 
um, because it gets us back to where we were, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, it really is a signal from the state that the state values these partnerships with local communities and local conservation groups like lake associations. Um, Stan, if there's any questions. Thank you, Mr. Forrester. Any questions from members for the bill author or for Mr. Forrester? Not seeing any representative hands. did you want to talk a little bit about what's going on with this in the Senate? Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members. This bill, I have agreed with Senator Ingebrigtsen and that th this would serve as a finance vehicle bill if needed as the session progresses. Any closing remark remarks for Representative Hansen? Uh, aquatic invasive species are uh, an important uh, concern. Uh, whether or not this is a vehicle bill, uh, that support is important. Uh, I think Representative Heinzman put his hand up as I was yep. starting. Representative Heinzman, did you have a question for the bill author or for Mr. Forrester? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. I just wanted to speak to it briefly. It's, I think, a great effort by the chair. Wanted to uh, uh, point out that. And then uh, it looks like the chair is keeping a few, or at least uh, has a few of these, and uh, really appreciate his effort on trying to work with Senator Ingebrigtsen to make sure that these are financed. And uh, Mr. Chair, you deserve credit. Wanted to just put that out there. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from members? Not seeing any hands going up. So Representative Hansen, you already gave your closing remarks. Um, Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 3617 be recommended to be re-referred to Ways and Means. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. All right. Vice Chair Wozlewick. Wozlewick, aye. Aye. Uh, Representative Hansen. Aye. Lead Heinzman. Aye. Heinzman votes aye. Representative Acomb. Representative Acomb. Representative Ackland. Ackland, aye. Ackland votes aye. Representative Backer. Backer votes aye. Backer votes aye. Representative Becker Finn. Becker Finn, aye. Becker Finn votes aye. Representative Eckland. Eckland, aye. Eckland votes aye. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher votes aye. Representative Green. Aye. Green votes aye. Representative Igo. Igo, aye. Igo votes aye. Representative Jordan. Jordan, aye. Jordan votes aye. Representative Keeler. Keeler, aye. Keeler votes aye. Representative Lee. Lee, aye. Lee votes aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert, aye. Lippert votes aye. Representative Lewick. Lewick votes aye. Lewick votes aye. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison votes aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson, aye. Nelson votes aye. Representative Tice. Tice, aye. Tice votes aye. I'll check one more time for Representative Acomb. All right. At chair, there are 18 ayes and one absent. The motion prevails and the bill is on its way to Ways and Means. Uh, next on the agenda is House File 3616. Um, Representative Hansen, would you like to move your bill? Yes. <clears throat> yes, Madam Chair. I would move that House File 3616 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Representative Hansen. Would you like to describe your bill for us, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. This bill provides $6 million to explore Minnesota for tourism recovery grant program. We have funded these in the past. This provides additional money for that. I do want to just point out uh, my intent as the author here. If members would look online, point 1.9, where it says money to organizations and communities, it would be my intent that tri tribal governments are also included in that. Um, and since this bill is being laid over, uh, we may tweak that when it's uh, uh, when it comes back. And I would like the testifiers just to 
uh, address that if they would like. Um, we have uh, several testifiers and uh, several folks available for, te for testifying. So uh, let's get to it. All right. First on the list, I have Sarah Sick. And please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Sarah Pasik, and I represent the Minnesota Tourism Growth Coalition, a statewide group of public, private, and nonprofit tourism organizations and businesses. And we want to thank Representative Hansen and the bill co-authors for sponsoring House File 3616. Tourism and hospitality was the first sector shut down by the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And while there's been some recovery in the industry, that recovery has not been consistent. There have been multiple starts and stops. Recovery is not even across the state or across tourism sectors. And we know that full recovery will take several years. The success of the tourism and hospitality industry plays a strong role in the success of a community. Local, regional, and state taxes provide support for community services. Tourism activity benefits local bars and restaurants, gas stations, grocery stores, theaters, event planners, stage crews, printing shops, outdoor recreation providers, and many more businesses, but I won't go on and name them all. The popular Explore Minnesota cereal boxes will arrive at your desk later this month, and on that box, you'll see information about how the industry has suffered economically during the pandemic including information broken down by county. Information from Explore Minnesota shows that tourism industry has suffered nearly 12 billion in travel spending losses since 2019. Leisure and hospitality gross sales fell from 16.6 .6 billion in 2019 to 11.7 billion in 2020. State sales tax collections fell from 1.1 billion in 2019 to 731 million in 2020. And jobs in these categories are down by approximately 70,000 workers. The bill under consideration today, House File 3616, will direct $6 million in one-time funding to a tourism industry recovery grant program. The grant program will flow through Explore Minnesota with 100% of the funds going directly toward accelerating tourism recovery. The grants will be used to support meetings, conventions, and group business, multi-community and high visibility events, and tourism marketing. And on Representative Hansen, on your proposed amendment, our organization would support that. And I apologize that that wasn't included in the original draft. We certainly support um, tourism across the entire state. Um, it's important to note that no other state agencies are serving the needs of Minnesota's destination marketing organizations, event organizers, or meetings industry with a grant recovery program like this. And this request does not overlap with existing Explore Minnesota programs. In 2021, the legislature appropriated $750,000 for a tourism recovery grant program. Thank you. Explore Minnesota reported that those funds were consumed within eight hours of opening the application period. So clearly there's a need for this funding today. Um, I, this bill is also supported by the Minnesota Association of Convention Bureaus and Hospitality Minnesota. I'll turn things over to testifiers who will share a perspective on tourism recovery from across the state. And I know that Explore Minnesota, it, is also available to answer any questions after the testifier. So thank you. Thank you. And I always look forward to getting those cereal boxes. They're very cool. Um, They're very up, popular. <laughs> yeah. Next up, we have uh, Rachel Thompson from Visit Greater St. Cloud. If you would like to unmute yourself and introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rachel Thompson. I am on the Board of Directors for the Minnesota Association of Convention and Visitors Bureaus, as well as the Executive Director for Visit Greater St. Cloud. Um, our organization represents the cities of St. Cloud and Wake Park and the surrounding communities within central Minnesota. 
I'm here fully supporting the Minnesota House File 3616. It is imperative to destination management organizations like mine and the communities that we represent um, to get these sorts of appropriations. These recover dollars are directly impacting the hospitality sector businesses that were hit the hardest over the last two years. As of January 27th, 2022, the USA Travel Association reported that the Minnesota tourism industry has suffered nearly $12 billion in travel loss spending since 2019. These losses are not going to be recovered without substantial support um, through the entities like Minnesota, uh, Explore Minnesota Tourism and the appropriations. Um, individual CVB budgets are largely tied to hotel motel lodging tax and have been severely impacted due to the pandemic and its ongoing impacts to the travel and event industry. Visit Greater St. Cloud alone um, has had an operational budget of 28.4% decrease in budget in 2021, and it's still projected to be 28% down in 2022. Now that is better than when you look at our 2020 numbers of 53.2% decreased, um, but we still have a far ways to go. Uh, the industry has made great advances um, and it is greatly attributed to recovery opportunities like we've had in the past um, through those appropriations through Explore Minnesota Tourism. The last uh, appropriation that we received, um, you've heard from Sarah that it was given away within eight hours. Something to note is that it opened at midnight. So what that means is it was gone by 8 a.m. So destination management organizations like myself woke up in the middle of the night because those dollars were so important to make sure that we had a chance at them. There clearly still is a need and these grant funds allow for destinations like myself to execute ad placement, target niche marketing for marketing approach, uh, marketing placements, win event contracts and fulfill marketing initiatives and plans that are necessary for us, us to obtain travel into our regions. For every dollar invested in Minnesota tourism marketing, it returns an estimated $180 in spending by travelers, as well as $18 in state and local taxes. Those additional tax, taxes raised also residually help our communities. Visit Greater St. Cloud was very fortunate and did receive 20,000 of the last recovery grant dollars from Explore Minnesota Tourism. From those dollars, we were able to receive over 500,000 impressions on banner ads for regional and seasonal activities in our area, run an ad in the Minnesota Travel e-newsletter for February and May, contract local video and photography production for nine months, which included six full videos and 12 short social format videos, along with the photos from over 30 attractions in our area. Those new assets are something that are invaluable to us as they were the first thing that potential travelers and event planners are seeing as they're looking to gain travel inspiration and make travel decisions. That content is extremely important as our previous materials had been um, tied to usage rights and things that are simply outdated now. The Explore Minnesota Tourism Recovery Grant Program funded with the appropriation would aid in bridging these current financial tax collection gaps and provide a recovery source directly for the promotion and support of tourism in all of our great Minnesota destinations. It is my recommendation and truly my plea to move 3616 forward. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next on the list is Terry Matson from Visit St. Paul. You could unmute yourself and identify yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members, uh, my name is Terry Matson. I'm the president and CEO of Visit St. Paul and the River Center uh, here in our capital city. I also serve on the Explore Minnesota Tourism Council where I chair the Public Policy Committee. Uh, I'm also president of the Minnesota Tourism Growth Coalition. Please join me in supporting this one-time pass-through recovery grant program. Thank you, Representative Hansen and co-authors for bringing this bill forward. Uh, I also support uh, including tribal communities uh, in this program. As the Metro Council representative at Explore Minnesota, I have immense firsthand experience and knowledge on uh, just how devastating the past two years have been uh, in the Metro. Also, I'm perhaps uh, somewhat uniquely qualified uh, as a presenter, having a, a background in greater Minnesota tourism, 
with nearly three decades uh, of experience as CEO of tourism in Duluth. Minnesota tourism was and is still deeply impacted by this global pandemic. Uh, the pain is widespread. The comeback curve swings widely depending on where you are in Minnesota. Um, and recovery also depends on, on who you are. While some have gained momentum, there are still many, many challenges and uncertainties for all of us. Uh, the situation in, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul uh, market is very desperate. Uh, typically, 70% of Minnesota's overall tourism sales are generated here in the metro. Uh, it's a big industry, but it's also very fragile. Uh, our revenues remain down by half or more. I'll share with you some specific St. Paul examples. Typically, uh, in Ramsey County, tourism generates about $2.3 billion in sales and directly supports 30,000 jobs. The immediate St. Paul area has lost more than 1 billion in sales, 70 million in related tax revenues, along with 15,000 to 20,000 lost jobs. Downtown St. Paul hotel occupancy uh, used to be consistently in the mid 60 percentiles. In 2020, it was 25%. In 2021, it was 32%. Uh, last week in the Senate, I, I stated that I thought we were at about 40% right now. We just got the numbers for January. They were actually more like 25%. So we've got some, some catching up to do. Uh, the related dramatic loss of hotel motel tax revenues have devastated funding sources for organizations such as Visit St. Paul. Uh, our funding has dropped by about 70%. We've implemented massive budget reductions and dramatically adjusted staffing. And we pivot time and time again. Uh, to continue with our important work. All destinations need this grant program to attract new meetings, conventions, and events, and to attract visitors across multiple segments who access our resources and media to plan their travel from online to print, social media, and digital influences. The improvements in COVID transmission are driving improvements in traveler sentiment, and our marketability is improving. Improvements have been made, uh, make no mistake that uh, return to normal, normalcy uh, still, still appears elusive. Destination promotion is for the benefit of every person in Minnesota. It is an essential high return investment to develop opportunities and build quality of life. We're actually uh, really in the best market position right now since COVID began, yet in many ways still the worst because of such depleted financial resources that frankly, aren't going to recover for years. St. Paul will not fully recover without tourism, and tourism won't recover without Visit St. Paul. Uh, I need your help. Other leaders in all communities across Minnesota need your help. As primary drivers of tourism's economic benefits, we need to be in the best position to attract visitors as soon as possible. The stakes have never been higher than they are right now for the long-term health of Minnesota's economy. We can build back better and stronger with your support. Getting visitors moving again, moving safely, will in turn get the Metro moving again. Thank you. Um, I encourage you to enthusiastically support this bill. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. Um, last testifier we have on the list is Mike Schweiders from Boyd Lodge. If you can uh, unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and then uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Mike Schweeters. I am from Boyd Lodge up in Cross Lake, Minnesota, and I also am the president of the Community of Minnesota Resorts, uh, which is approximately about 130 members mostly mom and pop type owner operator resorts uh, throughout the state of Minnesota. Some of our members, including myself, we've actually had a fairly strong 2021. However, I'm not dependent on restaurants. So I'm not dependent on bar. I don't have large banquet facilities, all of which we are seeing a tremendous need for funds and help. Um, while many in our areas are, are anxious and nervous about what's happening, I tend to be rather optimistic. The travelers are looking for an opportunity to go, and we need to reach out and make sure that they know Minnesota is the place that they can come, they can be safe, 
they know that they are going to be taken care of and we have availability and options to take care of them. With the help of Explore Minnesota Tourism, they really are from the state perspective, our voice, our way of marketing uh, out to outstate, uh, for example, Iowa, Dakotas, Wisconsin. Uh, with that said, we are also starting to see on our own programs locally here, uh, those other areas reaching out to Minnesota to try to direct their tourism out. Uh, Wisconsin Dells has really been aggressive with marketing. Uh, the Dakotas as well have done, uh, are starting to put out more marketing dollars. We need to be in that group as well. We need to be out there to let people know that we do have and are, well, are ready to accept them as guests to our state and to our events, our uh, you know, uh, activities that we have throughout the seasons in different parts of the state as well. And it's true that the metro area has really been hit hard by the, by the COVID. I mean, you look at, they're the ones that have the big conventions. They're the ones that have the music venues. They have those, they need help. Uh, they really do. And this is a great way to, to reach out and give them this one-time uh, assistance. You know, the, and it has been said, and it truly is, it's, this is, I, I, I look at this always as an investment. The monies that get spent here do get funneled back in the form of tax revenues. And for example, you know, with small communities like where I live, those monies stay in that community and just get cycled through and cycled through uh, with, with help. Uh, you know, I know our restaurants are not at 100%. I know our, our bars where they're having, you know, music venues and that they're not running at 100%. Uh, and that is so abnormal, especially up in the summertime around here. Um, so again, I, 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 Please uh, ask that you uh, support this bill. Uh, I, I, in my heart of hearts, I know it's going to help. And so thank you for your time. And I'll also be available for questions as well. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I do see a hand up, uh, Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for bringing this bill forward. I do support this and plan on uh, signing on. I think this question is mostly more for uh, Explore Minnesota. Uh, uh, knowing the uh, interest in the initial appropriations last year, what is the uh, agency doing to ensure that uh, underrepresented businesses, events, activities are promoted and benefiting from this appropriations? And what is being done to track and measure this impact? You no, know, we have a few, a couple people from Explore Minnesota on. I don't know if that's going to be Miss McGinty or someone else. Yes, Madam Chair, I can speak on that. Um, my name is Lauren Bennett McGinty. I'm the Executive Director of Explore Minnesota Tourism. And, um, you know, we do agree with the amendment uh, to include tribal communities. That has something that we've done previously. So um, we will be sure that that is part of the bill going forward. Um, and ultimately, you know, we support all of the communities in the state and want to help them succeed. So. Um, I think we we certainly have ways to track where this money is going and who it's going to and um, don't necessarily give preference in any way, but want to make sure that those communities are being supported. Um, additional things that we're doing on our side is, is building our council out to include more underrepresented communities as well. So um, realizing that's not part of this bill, but just knowing that it is um, important for Explore Minnesota to support those communities. Representative Lee, did you have a follow-up? Uh, I don't know if the chair has any uh, comments to that real quick before. Representative Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, because of the testimony we've heard, I, I, I'm going to change my motion to laying it over for an omnibus bill to laying it over until next Tuesday. I think there's been a compelling case that uh, this, you know, we've, we've just passed bills out for agriculture and the DNR um, I think we need to have rider language about so people don't have to get up at midnight to apply. I think mm -hmm. the same language on randomization, and perhaps we need to increase the appropriation. Uh, the case for timeliness, uh, and Representative Heinzman, I'm willing to work with you and, and uh, across the road in the Senate to see if uh, I think the case is here for emergency and timeliness, just as much as what we've heard uh, earlier with businesses. I have a lot of people in my district that work in downtown St. Paul and the hotels and the bars and the restaurants. And, uh, you know, we, if we're gonna help out everybody with, uh, with being one Minnesota, 
um, I think we can hold this over, not for an omnibus bill, to, but to move it. And I'd like to work with all the testifiers as well. Representative Heinzman, did you have a question real quick before we wrap up? No, Madam Chair, I didn't have a question. I had a comment. Go ahead, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Hanson, I just wanted to thank you for another good bill. It appears that you're hanging on to all the good ones for yourself. and you need to share the love a little bit. <laughs> um, your idea of potentially moving this forward in a more timely way makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And Ms. Biganti, did you have a follow up on that? I did, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to point out to Representative Hansen's point, and thank you for bringing this bill forward as well. Um, we are open to moving the timeline for grant applications. Um, that is something that we are able to adjust on our end. So I just wanted to make sure that that was on the record. Thank you. Um, Representative Hansen, did you have any closing remarks before we lay the bill over? Uh, we've got a few days. Let's work on it and see if we can uh, move this forward uh, um, to help Minnesotans out. I renew my motion that House File 3616 be laid over until Tuesday. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 3616 be laid over until Tuesday. The bill is laid over. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, members.